Well, I was always interested in music, and I, was, I had played music as a child, but you know, it was the kind of thing that the family didn't especially think was a worthy career. But as a percussionist, going into what I thought was going to be classical music, I realized that my options were really limited. I could play in an orchestra, I could play in some sort of popular music group, I mean, whether that would be jazz or a rock band or something like that, or I could do this thing which very, very few other people were doing, which involved an enormous kind of challenge as a performer and, you know, things that I'd never thought of or heard before. And so contemporary music loomed, I think, probably larger for me as an option because I was a percussionist and I didn't have the outlet, for example, of, say, playing classical music. Uh, had I been a cellist, I might have stayed in the 19th century, but that wasn't an option for me, so I went towards contemporary music. <laughs> Cage wrote great percussion music, but he didn't spend an enormous amount of time on it. So his first percussion piece was roughly the end of 1938, and his last one uh, was of, in 1942, the last of the first phase. He went back and did some things, but when we think of the percussion music of John Cage, we're thinking of, you know, a four-year span of an 80-year life. So it's a small amount of time that he spent on almost in the percussion phase of his life. Why was he interested in it, or why were people interested in that? I mean, in a certain sense, it's a kind of generational thing. I mean, how do you want to distance yourself from your parents? You listen to the kind of music that they hate, you know, and you listen to it loud. And in a weird way, that's what Cage did. Cage was studying with Schoenberg. He was a classical composer in the tradition of the great, you know, German and European romantic composers. And percussion was incapable of executing the music that his teachers and his forebears loved and did, and it furthermore, you know, had the salutary quality of irritating everybody around him who was older and more established. I mean, there's a great line of Schoenberg, who, had, who taught Cage as, uh, as a student at UCLA, that when Cage invited Schoenberg to a concert of percussion music, Schoenberg replied that he would, uh, was not free then, nor would he ever be free to hear a concert of John Cage's percussion music, you know. And voila, it's the same thing as playing Black Sabbath, a top volume from the upstairs, your upstairs bedroom, you know. It draws the line. And percussion music was untainted by what Cage and many of his contemporaries saw as the sort of stultifying, stale qualities of older music. It was fresh, it was new, it was rhythmic, it was noisy, it was brash, it, it didn't have harmonies, it had lines, it had rhythms, it had textures. It was everything that the old stuff wasn't, and, you know, it, it looked towards the future. solos is the Stockhausen Zyklus, and that's about, you know, 40-some uh, years old, 45 years old, in fact, right now. It's a very, very recent art form when you compare it with instruments that have a two- or three-hundred-year tradition. So it's natural that when a new important piece comes out, it, become, it comes out as a standard already, kind of like with the imprimatur of, of a classic piece, before, practically before it's even played. But of course, the, it's much more diverse art form now than it was 45 years ago with Zyklus, and so as things become, as there becomes more information, more options are available, the chances of a single overpowering musical piece lessen. I think that's a very, very good thing.
to tell you the truth. I think there's a much sort of more, there's a much more, there's a much greater biological diversity in the world of percussion now than there had, than there ever has been. to use music as a collateral, a kind of un unarticulated collateral. In other words, I listen to a piece of music not the way I am sure that I'm supposed to all the time, not to satisfy some expert, some imaginary expert listener, you know, to pass a test afterwards, but I listen to music for the same piece of music for widely different purposes at different kinds of times, sometimes as background. Sometimes I listen to very complex music that you really need to pay attention to as background. Now, I'm waiting for the thunderbolt that would strike me dead for saying that, but I think it's absolutely appropriate. I think that the one thing that's been liberated, we talk about the 20th century as the liberation of noise. I think the 20th, 21st century will be the liberation of listening, how we listen and what we use it for. Uh, I mean, uh, we have to listen a lot because there's a lot of public music out there. You hear it in elevators, you hear it in grocery stores, you hear it in massage rooms, you hear it everywhere, you know? And we don't have earlids, so we have to listen to it. We can't block it out really effectively the way you can a visual stimulus. And so we don't block so much as we assign. We assign music to fill certain kinds of functions as the need arises. There are moments when I use music almost essentially only as a trigger of memory. Sometimes I use music because I need something new to chew on, I'm tired of treading the same path all the time. Sometimes I listen to music because I don't want it to be quiet in the house. And I think all of these are valid, and, and none is more important than another, and none has to satisfy this kind of imaginary professor in the back of our heads that says, this is how you do it. <laughs> discovered as a kind of an instrument that could occupy the foreground in some way or another. There was this rush to explore it and to, to you know, celebrate it. And you saw these, these two or three big schools of percussion composition from the 1930s to the 60s and now and then recently again, I think, uh, in the last, say, 10 or 15 years. And I think you find that there's a, there is a little bit of, look, we haven't played in that yard yet. And now that's over. I really think that we can no longer say that percussion is being driven in any kind of way by its novelty. It either is going to function on its own or it's going to disappear as a solo instrument or as a, as a primary force. It doesn't always have to be solo, but as a primary force. Now I think in the world of classical, contemporary music at least, we've developed enough of a repertoire to assure its longevity and certainly in the, in the areas of jazz and, and rock and world music that's already been established long ago. So I don't think we're going to lose it, but it's no longer going to be the new toy. Famous, you know the famous article by Milton Babbitt, 
which was widely misinterpreted, but in any, in any event, it bore the title, Who Cares Who Listens? Well, I mean, I guess I have to say I do.